There is a phrase in one of the songs that uh, we have just sung. Did you catch it? Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world, world in love. Is that it? Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. That's a song I haven't heard for a while now. When I first heard it, especially that line, it just blasted into my heart. Heaven's peace, that is God's love, His relationship with people, His salvation, uh, the blood that was shed for us at the cross where we had been enemies with God and now, now restored to God because of what Jesus has done for us, heaven's peace and perfect justice. What was the perfect justice? It was also at the cross where Jesus was the one who paid our debt, who took our sins away, paid for our sin debt in full, in full. God's justice demanded payment for sin, And aren't you glad Jesus took your payment? I'm glad he took my payment. All of my sins, all of your sins paid for at the cross in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The justice of God had to be fulfilled. And so a sacrifice had to be given and someone had to taste separation from God and the reality of what hell is, the absence of God, someone had to taste that for you and for me, and that someone is Jesus Christ. Indeed, his name is wonderful. I should say his name is wonderful. Where would we be without him? Where would we be without him? Heaven's peace. Oh, to have peace with God. Do you have peace with God today? I trust that you do. That you're more than just a nominal believer. You're more than just a church attender, but that you know the peace of God that passes all understanding down deep in your heart. God's justice demands death. And there was a death so that you wouldn't die eternally. And that's in Jesus Christ. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed, kissed a guilty world in love. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. You remember a Philip in Acts chapter 8? A Philip was transported to the Gaza area of Israel. And as he came to that area, he likely didn't know why he was there, but he was there because of the Holy Spirit. And there was an Ethiopian official who was there reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And as that Ethiopian read from the book of the prophet Isaiah, he came to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon, of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, by his scourging, you are healed. And this Ethiopian said, To Philip, one of Jesus' men, what does this mean? And Philip said, don't you understand this? And the official said, how can I understand it? Someone has to explain it to me. And so it says there in Acts chapter 8 that Philip preached Jesus to him. Philip preached Jesus to him. Philip didn't preach 
about the emperor and how bad he was. Philip didn't preach about the society of Rome, how it was going to hell in a handbasket. He didn't preach about the latest trend, the latest fad throughout the Roman Empire. Instead, Philip preached Jesus to him. And I would submit that likely in that preaching of Jesus, as he interpreted Isaiah 53, in one way or another, Philip was sending forth this message to this man who needed to be saved, heaven's peace and perfect justice. At the cross, kissed a guilty world in love. Isn't that something? Now, if you're wondering if I'm ever going to get to the message, I'm not going to get there today, folks. I'm on another track. I'm on another track right now. So don't be looking up here and wonder when we're going to get to the message because time is going, you know, and when's pastor going to start? I'm starting. I'm starting. I've been going for a while right now because I just, I just am burdened with a message right now that Jesus Christ is all you need, all I need to live now in preparation for eternity. You remember in the early church, they proclaimed and preached and promoted this simple truth and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. No other name, no other name, no other name. That's why we are here in this church on this Sunday, is to proclaim and to worship and to glorify the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. We can be distracted, can't we? We can be distracted. We can get tired as we live out the faith. We can face challenges, struggles, and we can find ourselves kind of weary, even believers, followers of Jesus. We can be weary. Things hit us hard, health concerns, pain, suffering. The enemy comes with his fostering of confusion and lies and hatred in this world and in this time in which we're living. And all of this stuff can weigh down upon us and yes, upon followers of Jesus, we aren't exempt. But uh, that weight of all this stuff in the world, this world system that is so against the Word of God, so against Christ Jesus, this world system is that which can be a great weight upon our souls. And the Lord wants it to be said to you today, no matter the trial you are under, no matter the hurts, the wounds, no matter how hard it has been, even to get out of bed some days, I know that with some of you, know that very well. No matter... There is one in control, the Lord Jesus Christ. The next item on God's agenda is his coming again. At the rapture of the church where we're called out and then the days of tribulation come until finally God comes, puts an end to everything. After the end of that seven-year tribulation and Jesus establishes his kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth, all that's coming for the
The born-again man, the born-again woman is literally mind-blowing. We can't figure it all out. We can't analyze it enough. Our puny minds fall short. But I want to tell you, there is hope. There is victory in Jesus. There is the overcoming one, the overcoming one who gave his overcoming life for you, for you and for you and for you, for you personally, and all of your needs, all of your struggles. He loves you and cares for you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick it up at verse 31. Romans 8 and verse 31. Now just drink in these words from the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Romans. But he's also writing to you and to me. Let's take it as a personal word to each one of us. Listen to it now. Begin at verse 31, Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who is against us? He, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God's elect are those who are trusting Jesus, following the Lord, going to heaven. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Jesus prays for you right now. He prays for us. Who better to pray for us than the Son of God? You see, we talk of the cross being Jesus, uh, his finished work. The cross when he died, that was the finished work of salvation. Nothing can be added to that. The finished work of the cross. But Jesus' unfinished work is that he keeps on praying for us. He prays for you and your burden that you have in your home, in your life, with a loved one, perhaps in your grief, at the job. He prays for you. Then notice verse 35, who will intercede or who will separate us from the love of Christ. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? All that's happening in the world today, can it separate us from the love of Christ? Well, look at the answer here. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but... Don't pass over the little words in Scripture. But is a very important word in different places. Here it is, verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced. You see, Paul will not be shaken. He's convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Someone needs to hear this scripture today. Someone right here. Someone needs this. This is a word of encouragement for a troubled soul, for someone bowing down under the, the weight of just living. Life can be so hard. This is a word of victory. 
as he says here, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer. If you are in Christ, you're trusting him, you are a conqueror. You are an overcomer. And that is one of the reasons why we worship God privately and also corporately. We can express to God how grateful we are that God in his mercy has made us more than conquerors. How can it be more than a conqueror? But in Christ you are. Do you hear what I'm saying, beloved? Do you hear? These are not just idle words here. This is the word of God. Someone said to me yesterday, and I heartily agreed, he said, referring to the, the Bible, the Word of God, isn't it wonderful our God has given us so much to deal with, to work with? And he has, hasn't he? He's given us a lot of material. And it comes from his heart of undying, everlasting love for you and your particular life, your needs, your concerns, your burdens. We serve a God who is personal, who enters into our lives, who has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Never. We have the victory. We have the victory that God has established and won for us at Calvary's cross. Do we know it? Do we receive it? A church can go on for decades, even centuries, and not be alive in Christ. That's the danger of hearing God's word over and over and yet not responding, just taking it in. You see, the Dead Sea in southern Israel, the Dead Sea is dead because it simply takes in water from the Jordan River. It has no outlet, has no flow out. It's dead. The salt content there is about three times what the salt content is of the oceans. It's a dead sea. And you see, we can be taking things in all the time, sitting back, taking things in, and yet never once taking that step to surrender to the Lord our hearts, our minds, our very lives. That's just church. It's just church. But how sad when it's just church and the church is more valuable than Christ. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. That's what our Lord has done. Scripture says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. The demonstration, the demonstration of love is at the cross. May God deliver us from a half-hearted walk with the Lord. Oh, we want to walk with him, but it's half-hearted. If things come up, well, those things come first, things to do, and so the Lord can wait. And in his grace, he does wait. 
And Jesus waits with arms extended for how long? Sometimes for years, for years. I know of people who have been prayed for for 50 years to get saved. And yes, after 50 years, they got saved. You think of those open arms of Jesus all that time. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would move among us, would move among us, loved ones, that we might really have our joy in Jesus and what he has done, and that we might be winsome, joyful, proclaimers and sharers of what we're talking about here, what God has done for us in Jesus. It's not what you do. It's not what I do. It's what was done for us when God gave us his plan of salvation. God gets the glory. Not a church, not a person. God gets the glory. It is all of God. All of God. Many years ago now, during during or just after the First World War, one of the English nobility was visiting a hospital where the British soldiers had been taken who had suffered wounds. And this particular royal person representing the kingdom, the empire of Great Britain, he came and he began to visit these wounded soldiers. He went to one room and then another, went into another section, saw people. And this one, and it may have even been the king, I can't be sure of that, but it might have even been the king of England at that time, as he walked through to pay his respects to all of these suffering soldiers, he came to a, a hall where there was a door, there was a lock on it, and he said he wanted to go into that place. He'd seen a lot of the others, who's in there? I don't want to miss anyone. And the people around him said, sir, you do not want to go into that place because in that place are the most disfigured specimens of humanity that you'd ever want to see. These are people that are hard to look at. We don't want you to look at these people. It'd be too much. But the king said, no, I want to go and see these soldiers. So they opened up the door. He walked in there. And he came to the bed of a soldier hideously disfigured. You'd hardly recognize a face. And that king looked at the soldier. He didn't say anything. He just bent over and kissed that face. Kiss that face of ugliness. And loved ones, that is what Jesus has done for each of you. At the cross, heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty, ugly, world in love. It's all about Jesus, loved ones. It's all about Jesus. Oh, that he would stir us from pulpit to pew, that he would stir us 
to know him more, to love him more, and to be, shall we say, shall I venture to say more radical for him? More radical for him? More out and out for him? Because of what? Because of what he's done for us. He kissed your soul and mine with love. God, help us to live for him. And today, as we close our service, I'm going to remain here at the front. If you have a prayer need, a concern, come join with me in prayer. Don't leave without a prayer if you sense that need today. We get so used to the traditional things. We come in, talk a bit, we sit down, we have the services, sing the songs, hear the message, whatever it is, struggle through to the end, and then we're out the door. Out the door. But could it be that the Lord wants to meet you at his altar today, that you can reaffirm your your life with him? And if there's someone here who has no peace with God, that today you would come to know the peace of the Lord through Jesus Christ. You're welcome to come as well. Let's stand as we join together with the benediction and then the concluding hymn. Now unto him who is able to make you stand in his presence blameless. Think of it. This isn't just a benediction. This is the word of God. He is able to make you, you, you stand in his presence blameless. That means he doesn't hold your sins against you because his son paid for them. Blameless. With great joy. It will be a great joy to stand blameless before the, the Lord of hosts. Now unto him be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Do you hear what God says, people? Do you hear? Yes. Yes, you have a voice. You can respond. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's the amen. Now let's sing to the glory of God as we conclude. <laughs>